Creatine has recently been in the press for its benefits related to mental health. Several studies have tested it as a natural treatment for depression, often with great results. So in this video, I want to explain how exactly creatine helps lower symptoms of depression, the biochemistry behind it, and what it does to your brain, how to optimize the mental health benefits of creatine, and why it alone often isn't enough. To start off, let me show you an article that gives us a good overview of the most recent studies done on creatine and mental health, especially depression. Okay, so as you can see, the article is called Creatine, a popular exercise supplement might help treat depression. And the key takeaways give a good overview of what the article is about. It states that creatine is a safe and relatively inexpensive and commonly used dietary supplement known to be effective at boosting athletic performance and aiding recovery. Over the past two decades, researchers have started testing it for uses in other areas, such as cognition, blood sugar control, and heart disease. Creatine shows the most promise as a potential treatment for depression, boosting the effects of SSRIs, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and potentially working as a standalone medication in higher doses. The article then basically starts off by explaining the role creatine plays in sports and how it is one of the few supplements that actually delivers on its promise, in this case, to improve your athletic performance. The way creatine does this is that it boosts ATP availability. ATP is your main energy currency in your body and having more of it available during high intensity exercise, such as sprinting or weightlifting, will give you a slight performance boost. In terms of weightlifting and from my own experience, I can say that being on creatine, I was able to maybe get one or two additional reps on any given exercise compared to when not being on creatine. So this would be a strength increase from around five to maybe 15% max when being on creatine. And it's definitely noticeable. I was definitely able to build muscle at a faster rate when taking creatine. But then again, I was what you would call a creatine hyperresponder, and I will talk about that in more detail later in the video. The article then goes on to say that in more recent years, more and more research has shown that creatine also has applications outside of sports, and the most promising, like they said in the beginning, was for depression. The author then lists several studies where creatine intake was linked to better depression treatment. For example, one study from South Korea had participants either take an antidepressant or an antidepressant together with creatine. And almost across the board, the group that took antidepressants together with creatine had better mental health markers at the end of the study. Another study that analyzed survey data from over 22,000 people showed a significant negative relationship between a dietary creatine intake and depression in adults. And at the end, the article summarizes the current consensus on creatine as follows. While it is too early to conclusively tout creatine as a treatment for depression, a trifactor of factors, being low risk, high reward, and affordable cost, make it promising indeed. Now, of course, this article was just an example, and so were the studies that I showed you. But online, you will find a lot that are similar. They basically all say the same thing. Creatine is definitely promising as a natural treatment for depression, but we need more research and we don't exactly know how it works. Of course, this is good news for anyone suffering from mental health issues, especially depression. But for someone like me who is interested in the biochemistry behind all of it, it's kind of unsatisfying because you want to know what is actually going on here. How can a sports supplement help your mental health? And that's basically what I want to talk about in the rest of the video because we actually do know how it works. You just have to connect the dots correctly. When you read through the literature on creatine and mental health, at the end of each study, you usually get a theory of the author of what they think how creatine affects mental health positively. And it's usually one of three things. Either they will mention the enhancement of overall energy production. This is nothing new and we've known it for decades. That's why creatine is used in sports. Next, they might talk about its reduction effects on overall inflammation. This was especially shown in a study done on sprinters who had lower inflammation markers when taking creatine. Or lastly, they will talk about its ability to improve brain function and regulate neurotransmitters. Basically, what was often shown in studies is that the normal and healthy functioning of neurotransmitters seems to depend on certain biochemical pathways 
that are positively influenced by creatine. Just to give you a quote from one study, altogether, these data hinted at the fact that functional neurotransmission depends on intracellular energy metabolism supported by the creatine phosphocreatine system. Now, earlier in the video, I promised you that I would explain how exactly creatine helps lower symptoms of depression. But based on these three theories, there doesn't really seem to be one consensus. So how can I say that? Well, if you're familiar not just with the research on creatine, but the research on nutritional psychiatry in general, so how to treat mental illness naturally with foods and supplements, you can actually connect the dots and see what is going on here. This is actually a very common problem in modern research. The fields of nutritional research and psychiatric research are very disconnected from each other, and very few people actually take the time to read outside of their field of speciality. This leads to a phenomenon called undiscovered public knowledge, where certain research questions have been answered by other researchers before, but because they're not talking to each other, very few people are seeing the bigger picture. This is a huge problem in modern academia, and it leads to many research questions remaining unanswered when really all you have to do is to read outside of your normal field. So here's what's actually driving most of creatine's benefits when it comes to mental health. The key is methylation, which I explain in more detail in a different video. It's basically an on-off switch that your body has to regulate certain important processes. These processes can be anything, from hormones to regulating your DNA or your neurotransmitters. Proper methylation comes down to the availability of methyl groups in your body. And these methyl groups can be attached to everything that I talked about before. So hormones, DNA, or neurotransmitters. And they often need to be attached for these things to function properly. Just to give you an example for melatonin, so the primary sleep hormone to function properly, it needs to be methylated. So you can have optimal melatonin levels. But if your methylation isn't working properly, then you will still run into problems. That's where creatine comes into play. The natural synthesis of creatine in your body requires quite a lot of methyl groups, which are then not available for other processes in your body. If you supplement creatine, so you give creatine from the outside, your body no longer relies on its own synthesis. So these methyl groups are then freed up. The way this works is that creatine synthesis requires three main amino acids, glycine, arginine, and methionine. Methionine is a primary methyl donor, and if it's used up for the creation of creatine, it cannot be used for other things. If you take in creatine, you spare methionine, and you also spare its metabolically more active counterpart, SAMe, which you may know as a natural supplement for depression. It really all starts to make sense when you start looking at it from a perspective of methylation. Some research suggests that although only 20% of all people naturally have lower methyl levels, they make up a large part of all depression patients. And their lower methyl levels lead to suboptimal neurotransmitter levels, which then lead to depression. These people are called undermethylators, and there are specific nutritional protocols that they can follow to raise their methylation. The most in-depth research on methylation and mental health is done by the Walsh Institute, and I review the Walsh protocol in a different video. Definitely check it out if you're interested in the topic. Oftentimes these nutritional healing protocols do wonders for undermethylators and some even get rid of their depression completely. All this is done with natural foods and supplements. Usually it's through supplementing direct methyl donors like SAMe or TMG, but like I said before, it can also be done through methyl sparing supplements like creatine. That's basically what the researchers did in the studies that were mentioned in the article at the beginning of the video. Unknowingly, they raised their patient's methylation status. And because such a large proportion of depression patients are under methylators, it really did wonders when they brought their methylation back into balance. I've seen sources mentioning that creatine can reduce the demand for methylation by up to 50%, which would mean the world for an undermethylator. In fact, most creatine hyperresponders, so not just those that see benefits in terms of mental health, but overall energy are undermethylators. I'm an undermethylator and I was also a creatine hyperresponder. Really, all you're doing is giving your body the raw materials so it can finally do its job properly. That means better energy levels and better neurotransmitter production. 
Okay, so that's the biochemistry behind all of it. Before I end this video, let me quickly explain why creatine alone isn't enough when it comes to treating your mental health and depression naturally with foods and supplements. You see, methylation is a very complex topic, and it's more than just increasing your methyl groups in your body. There are also overmethylators, for example, that naturally have higher than optimal methyl levels. In such a case, raising their methyl groups even further would backfire, so you definitely need to know your individual status before embarking on a nutritional program. Again, if you're more interested in the topic, please watch my videos on methylation and the Walsh Protocol. I cover everything in more detail there. Another thing you need to know is that in some cases, it can even make sense to ignore methylation altogether and first focus on other aspects of your nutrition. I say this because I see a lot of people getting caught up in the complexity of methylation while losing the bigger picture. This could mean fixing a magnesium deficiency first or an electrolyte imbalance before tackling methylation. Okay, to wrap up this video, let me quickly give you a summary of the most important things we talked about in this video. First, the reason creatine is a promising treatment for depression really comes down to methylation and its ability to free up methyl groups. This primarily benefits undermethylators, but could backfire on overmethylators. Unfortunately, even though the current literature theoretically knows this, very few researchers are able to connect the dots, and this keeps them from giving good and practical advice. Of course, all of this is just my opinion looking from the outside in. I hope you liked this video and I see you in the next one.